Well, good evening, everybody. Hello, hello. Lovely to see you. And welcome to week three of this year's uh, Lent Talks. I wasn't here uh, last week to hear Joe in person, but I have caught up with it online. Joe, thank you so much for sharing uh, with us last week. Um, and next week's Lent Talk is going to be with uh, Reverend Agnes Sam. Some of you will have met Agnes already. She's the newish Methodist minister at Thorpe Bay and Shubriness and Wakerin. So uh, she's great, and we're very pleased that she's here. She shared uh, the Bible readings when we had our week of prayer for Christian Unity Service, if that helps you put a face to a name. Anyway, and Agnes is going to be with us next week, so we look forward to hearing from her. But tonight, all the way from uh, the north of the county, um, we have the Reverend Sandra Crawford. Hello, Sandra. Hello. Welcome, welcome. And now, talking a bit earlier tonight, we, we think that you've probably been here once before. Well, I think I came here when I was seven. <laughs> I was in the girls' brigade, and I think we came here for a week and slept on the floor. That was our girls' brigade holiday. There you are, there you first, are. First Claybury Park girls' brigade, there we go. First Claybury Park, yeah. okay. Anyone remembers first Claybury Park sleeping on the floor? Um, no, yeah, there you go, go. there you go. There you go. So, and people remember it, just about. Uh, I remember Saffron Warden and Shoebury Ness. They were the two girls' brigade holidays that I did. Oh, well, there you go. There you go. There um, and Sandra, you're um, going to tell us a bit about life in, in the north of the county in a minute. Um, but until fairly recently, you weren't just in the north of Essex, you were in the north of England. Yep. Um, tell us a little bit about what you were doing in the northwest. So I went to be a youth pastor for three years uh, in Manchester and stayed for 27. <laughs> <laughs> met my, well, I met my husband before that, He's, he is a northerner. Um, so after 27 years up there of uh, youth pastor, then became a Baptist minister, then became a regional minister, um, I gave that all up and I moved to Jaywick. <laughs> yeah. What do you miss most about living up north? The weather. No, I don't miss the weather. <laughs> I moved from the wettest place in the country to the driest place in the country and I love it. Someone said to me this week, we've had a lot of rain recently, we haven't, haven't we? And I went... No. <laughs> what do I miss? I miss my children because I've left them up there. They've grown up and they've stayed up there. So I do miss my children. Um, I don't miss the hills. I'm a cyclist, so I quite like Essex because it's pretty flat, isn't it? So uh, I am very glad to be home. I grew up in Ilford um, and left there at 19 and I've really just come back. So, um, yeah, it's nice to be home. People understand me here. They're now saying to my husband, what are you saying? Because he's yeah. got a northern <laughs> accent, so that's quite nice, yeah. Um, and so we've been gathering on these Tuesday evenings um, as part of how we're marking the season of Lent. Um, does Lent mean anything significant for you? Do you do anything to mark Lent? How does it land in your life? It varies. So I, for a few years I was a messy church minister and... Um, so we used to do 40 days of generosity in Lent. So rather than give something up, we would uh, look at ways every day of being generous. And we did that a lot over lockdown, actually. We did a lot of that kind of stuff. Um, so, yeah, so this year, the two verses that I'm going to talk about later, I'm just reading those verses every day. My intention was to do it three times a day. Okay, I failed. Uh, so I do it once a day. And I've just been chewing over those verses, and every day I read it in a different version to see kind of how different it looks from different angles and how I can apply that in the day. So I, I kind of take it as an opportunity to do something different to try and hear God in a different way, I guess. I like the sound of that. Now, I don't know if you're going to talk about this uh, in a minute, but tell us about what being a messy church minister is like. So, um, yeah, I was, I was asked to go to a church... To, I was called to go to a church to um, help them develop messy church as church, not just as an activity. So I spent five years there um, and um, we've built messy church into a congregation in its own right. 
So we, we looked at what did it mean to have pastoral care within Messy Church. We even had our own deacons around Messy Church, that that was their focus. We looked at what mission meant within Messy Church. What does giving mean within Messy Church? We really tried to build it as a congregation in its own right. Uh, it was a battle uh, with lots of people in the church who thought I was splitting the church. And I'm like, no, we're just planting a different congregation. And eventually, actually, the Messy Church congregation was bigger than the, uh, the original congregation. Sadly, over lockdown, the whole thing collapsed. And the problem is with Messy Church, because you're on the whole working with younger families, two years within the life of a younger family is a heck of a lot of time, isn't it? Um, and I left within that, within lockdown. Um, we'd already told the church we were going. Um, so it all kind of collapsed, which was really sad. But I loved the journey. It was fab. We like the sound of that. And we are very glad that you've come down to Shoebury Ness. And uh, we look forward to hearing uh, what you've got to share with us this evening. Okay. So I'm going to hand over to you. Let's welcome Sandra, everybody. So I think I'm going to start with, um, so we're in Jaywick, <laughs> with no church, um, God called my husband and I there um, probably about seven years ago, and we moved about two years ago, we were a bit deaf for a while, um, but God carried on calling us, so we moved to Jaywick, I don't know what you know about Jaywick, but uh, I thought I'd show you a quick TikTok video, I didn't make it, uh, a TikTok video uh, which tells you a little bit about uh, Jaywick. A guide to Jaywick. This is the big one, the one that I've been putting off for months. It is the most deprived town in the whole of England. It's the eighth worst place to live in the country, but that's not the half of it. Why have I been putting it off? Well, one, I wasn't sure how to deal with it in a sensitive manner, and two, I was quite scared. It's got a bit of a reputation. I didn't even really know where it was. Turns out it's just along the road from here, Clacton-on-Sea, which is a normal British seaside town full of bright lights and deceit. Now, Clacton was famous for something. What was it? Oh, yeah, okay. Don't worry about it. Let's go down to Jaywick. You go past two golf courses and a children's farm to get to the most deprived area in the country, which I thought was a bit odd. But once I got to Jaywick, I chilled out pretty quickly. It didn't seem that bad on first impressions. Remember that on first impressions. They seem to have everything you need. A couple of takeaways, a little Morrison's, a Jennings bet, a hair salon. Wait, hang on. What the hell is a Jennings bet? After light research, I found out that Jennings are to bookmakers what Iceland are to supermarkets. It's as you get further into Jaywick that you realise where its reputation comes from. I can't dress it up or joke about it. It is very run down. They have a pub called the Never Say Die and it is a small place. Not many people live here. A few people even came to talk to me interested about who I was, but all of them were incredibly friendly. It was early in the morning. Morning, though. Now it's time to blow your mind. This is the Brooklands estate, the most deprived part of the most deprived town in the country. But look, it is on a beach, not just any beach, a stunning beach. It's incredible. The beach the Jaywick locals have is beautiful. It's lovely golden sand and it's on the North Sea, not the English Channel. The English Channel is more diesel than water. The North Sea is beautiful and pure. Granted, it's about minus 14 on a warm day, but let's not get bogged down in that now. I was confused by the whole place, but it turns Turns out that Jaywick was originally built as a holiday park in the 1930s. The war then happened and there was a shortage of housing so people moved in permanently. Because of its geographical location and no industry anywhere near, it all kind of just fell apart and was forgotten by every government since. Surprisingly, there is still a holiday park here and this is my master plan. If you are a wealthy Londoner, always banging on that the country needs to be levelled up, Buy a holiday home here, come every weekend, insist on spending £80 on a bottle of wine with the locals. And before we know it, there will be cockapoos everywhere, Heston and Rick Stein will have open restaurants, and all of the residents will be driving brand new German cars. There are the green shoots of development, but what do I think of the place? It's nice, it's not the eighth worst place to live in the country, I guarantee you that. Yes, it's deprived, yes, it needs investment, but would I rather live here or Croydon? Well, here, simply for the beach. The People are nice as well. There's only about 5,000 of them, so they all know each other. That made them a little bit suspicious of me, but the three that came over to speak to me were really, really friendly. One of them was also really, really drunk, and considering it's 10 o'clock on a Sunday morning, I couldn't help but feel well done. Why have I got my rucksack on? Um, I, I didn't want to leave anything in the car, I won't lie. How do you speak that fast? <laughs> so, um... Yeah, we moved to Jaywick uh, two years ago. Um, people keep saying to me, are you going to plant a church? I don't think so. <laughs> I 
I don't really know if I'm honest. God's called us there um, to be community ministers. Um, it's kind of not the kind of thing a Baptist, the Baptist Union do, if I'm honest. So I had to ask whether we could do that, because normally you'd be called by a local church, wouldn't you? And that's how you get your stipend. So it's a bit of a problem, really, because we don't have a local church. Um, but I work part-time at the youth centre. My husband, ha- who's also a Baptist minister, has retrained as a social worker. Uh, he doesn't uh, work in Jaywick. He works in Suffolk. Um, but our plan is to live there for the rest of our lives and to work out what it means to be um, Jesus people in that community. It is the most warm and welcoming community that we've ever lived in. Uh, It is an area of high deprivation and deprivation on just every level. Uh, I work in the youth centre. I have 30 years' experience of youth work, um, not like in (laughs) Jaywick. We have five paid youth workers in every youth work session. Uh, and we just about cope. Um, The the behaviour of the children is like nothing I've ever experienced. Um, But I'll tell you a little bit about how I've met God in that situation a bit later on. Um, We haven't come to bring Jesus to Jaywick, because you know what? He's already there. Um, And the one thing that, that, that has come through to us for the last seven years as we've been thinking about this is our role in Jaywick is to bring out the God colours that are already there, and just bring them out and reveal them. And the youth centre I work in is a local charity. It's been there for 17 years. Their strap line is um, inclusion, not exclusion. And I tell you what, that is a bit of the kingdom of God in the middle of Jaywick. And yet when I walked in there and said, can I come and work with you? Can I come and volunteer with you? They said, yes, but we don't do religion here. And I went, well, that's okay. I don't really do religion either. Um, So... But the way they are with the children and families, to include, not to exclude, they are a a shining light of the kingdom of God in that place. And that's what I believe that God's called us there to do, is just to reveal the God colours. So I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, But I want to tell you um, just a few stories of the last 30 years uh, of some people that I've met who have really challenged my understanding of who God is, what Christianity should be all about, and what church is about. Um, Please bear with me, I live with ME, and at the moment it's quite bad. My memory is rubbish, so I need to follow a script, otherwise I have no idea what I've said, okay? So apologies about that. Uh, I would rather be a little bit more wandering around, but I can't do that at the moment, so... So I'm going to talk, and then hopefully... Well, there will be time at the end, because I don't know that many words to fill up the next 45 minutes. Um, so if you hang on to some questions and ask at the end, that's, that's, that's fine, that's what we'll do. So, I have over the past 30 years, I know I don't look old enough, became a minister when I was five. Um, I have over the last 30 years been involved in loads of different ways of sharing the gospel, sharing the good news. I've been on courses, I've read books, I've been trained on the job, And my reflection is that the way we approach sharing the gospel is a bit like making soup. That's why I bought my soup maker. If you didn't know what that was, it's a soup maker. I'm not going to make it tonight because it's a bit noisy. But if you haven't got one, they're really worth it. Soup's been around for a very long time. So since since the uh, Bronze Age, soup's been around. It used to be made with fresh food, didn't it? Put into like a cauldron and soup was made. But over the years, we've changed it, haven't we? We've changed it to, it's it's prepared in a building, all right? So we've canned it, okay? So we've got broccoli and Stilton. Um, You might think this is a little bit like fresh soup, but it's not really fresh, is it? Because if it's been in a supermarket, it's not that fresh. So, yeah, so we've got carrot, parsnip and thyme. And And then we've done this to soup. We've put it in a packet like that. Can you call that soup? Compared to what you would get out of a soup maker when you put fresh veg in it, is that really soup? Mm, Possibly. It's quite good if you're on Slimming World. But I think we've done the same with the life-changing message of Jesus. Jesus had a radical message. He lived a radical life. It takes quite a lot of getting your head around when you read the stories of Jesus. 
The coming of Jesus was a point of no return. Things changed. And he left us with a commission. Go and make disciples. That's not the only bit, though, because he also said, love God, love your neighbour as yourself. And sometimes I think we forget. Oh, love others. That's, that needs to be in there. Sometimes I think we forget that bit. Love others. Love yourself. But I think we've tried to package the gospel in convenient ways that are a bit like this. So I've done evangelism courses. I've done sketchboarding. When I used to sketchboard, do you know what sketchboarding is? When you go on the streets, right? When I used to do that, someone came up to me once and went, isn't it really good that God's given you a big mouth? And I still don't know to this day whether that was a compliment or an insult. (laughs) But anyway, I've done sketchboarding. I've done door-to-door with Jesus videos. Anyone else done these things, or is it just me? Oh, it's just me, okay. Um, I've done street drama. I've been on courses about how to tell my testimony in the time that it takes a match to burn, and if you keep, if, if you go too long, you burn your fingers. You know, you've done it, haven't you? Been there, okay. We've invited evangelistic speakers. I've done tent missions. I've heard Billy Graham, I am that old. And it feels like we've tried to get the gospel of Jesus into something this size that I can give to you fairly quickly and go swallow that, there we go, and then come to church on Sunday. I kind of don't think that's what Jesus meant us to do. So I've spent a little bit of time unpacking all that really. I have got a little bit frustrated over 27 years of being a minister that success is bums on seats on a Sunday. Okay, and we still seem to be struggling with that one. Um, (coughs) So, yeah. I just don't think some of this stuff works. I don't think it ever worked. I certainly don't think it works now. And I think we have to think it through. In most churches, we have several generations missing. Um, So my generations and below are missing in a lot of churches up and down the country. Activities are now run on rotors because we can't get people to um, to commit to them every week. And I wonder whether we are propping up something that is no longer fit for purpose. If you don't like what I'm saying, you'll never see me again, so don't worry about it. (laughs) But it has caused me over the last few years to stop and think, what is it we are trying to do? What, what, What is it that Jesus left us with that commission to go and do. And I don't think it was putting it into a soup packet to give away to as many people as possible as quickly as we can. As I've reflected, I've thought about stories of people over the years that have literally caused me to stop and think, this gospel does not work for the person standing in front of me. Therefore, I've got it wrong, and I need to rethink So I'm going to tell you a few of those stories. Now, to warn you now, the first story is the longest. They're not all going to be that long, okay? So don't worry about it. But I'm writing a book, um, uh, writing a chapter of a book at the moment, not a whole book, just a chapter. That's far, that's enough for me. And it's caused me to revisit some of these stories of people I've met who have caused me to profoundly think, what is Jesus about? What is church about? And what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? So we're going to think a little bit, just about two Bible passages. Um, one of them is Micah 6, 8, and it says this in the message. These are two Bible passages that bounce around in my head quite a lot. He's already made it plain how to live and what to do. What God is looking for in men and women, it's quite simple. Do what is fair and just to your neighbour. Be compassionate and loyal in your love. And don't take yourself too seriously. Take God seriously. And then Romans 12 was the other passage, and it says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. 
So I'm going to tell you some stories of some people that enabled my mind to be a bit renewed. When I was a youth pastor in Manchester, I was leading a church youth group. We had a God slot every week, five minutes where you wanted the young people to sit down, be quiet, so I could give them their packet of soup, their gospel. It never worked. It was the relationships you spent ages building up, you broke down in that five minutes trying to get them to sit down, shut up and listen to you. So I had this bunch of young people who caused a bit of disruption, a lot of disruption. So they pulled the toilet system off a wall, so I spent one evening waiting for a couple of deacons to turn up while I sat straddled on the toilet, facing the wall, holding the system on the wall because there was water pouring everywhere. I was six months pregnant, was not a pretty sight. No one knew how to turn the water off, so we're ringing around the deacons going, will someone get here before Sandra drowns in the toilets? So that was one week. Another week, they wouldn't leave the building, so we had to get the police to come to the building to get them to leave the building. So the children that were behaving, we had to send home early because the others were causing chaos and wouldn't leave the building. I was a really popular youth pastor. Um, and then... The final straw was when this group of young people decided to tap dance on the roof of our cars uh, and damage the cars. And the youth leaders, the volunteers, said to me, either they go or we go. Well, I'm kind of backed into a corner at that point, aren't I? Because if my youth leaders leave, I don't ever, I can't run a youth group. But I kind of felt, if we ask these young people to leave and not come back, what did that tell them about God? That God didn't want them either. So I had to ask them to leave, but I decided to work with them on the streets and said, so on a Friday night I had another youth session where I went on the streets with a team of people, we used to call it detached youth work, and we just used to hang around on the streets with them. And we did that for six and a half years. The first night I went out, um, the guy at the back, you're you're the youth worker here now, aren't you, Wally? Okay, what's your name? Harry. Harry, okay. The art of youth work is... To think, you know, show everyone you know what you're doing, but you're blagging it, basically. Because that's what we did. For six and a half years, I blagged that I knew what I was doing, leading a team of youth workers out on the streets. I was clueless. I got myself into some very sticky situations. But the first night we went out, I met a young woman, do you want to put the first slide up, um, called Maggie. And um, when we walked up to her, she... I won't use the language she used, but she said, who are you and what are you doing here? So uh, I said, well, we're youth workers and we've decided to come out and work on the streets for some of you. Some of you know us already, but Maggie didn't know us. Um, Maggie was like the unofficial leader of the girls. So there were about 20 girls on the streets um, on a Friday night and Maggie was kind of their unofficial leader. She was a little bit older. Um, she She hadn't gone to school after the age of 14, She was known to the police for a number of offences, minor offences. She drank quite a lot and was taking some drugs. Um, She had no fixed address. She used to sleep on the streets. uh, No, sorry. She used to sleep at her mum's or on her grandma's floor or on a friend's sofa, that kind of thing. Through Maggie, she was the one who really stopped me in my tracks because I realised the gospel that I understood was a white, educated, middle-class understanding of gospel that came from London Bible College. I had my degree, I had my piece of paper, but my understanding of gospel didn't work for Maggie. So there was a problem. After a couple of weeks of knowing Maggie, uh, I finally had a reasonable conversation with her, and she was due in court on Monday morning. Uh, And I offered to go with her, (laughs) and she said no. But I turned up anyway. I had no idea what I was doing. I turned up at court. Didn't know, I didn't even know if they were going to let me in. But they did let me in. And she saw me. She swore at me. And I said, I just thought I'd come and uh, sit with you because I knew no one would be here. And I spent the day sitting with her, waiting for her case to be heard uh, for theft. Do you know how awkward that is for someone you hardly know to sit with them in an environment you have no idea of anything about? And it took all day. At lunchtime, they said we could go and have some lunch. So I took her out for lunch. She wanted to run away. Well, I knew enough to say that's not a good idea, Maggie. 
um, took her back, and then I saw this amazing drama as she stood in the court, as polite as anything, and said, I'm very sorry, Your Honour, <laughs> blah, 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 and I saw this display, and she got a fine and she got community service, and that was the third time that I knew of she'd been in court, and then afterwards she was in court quite a lot more. But she always put on this display in court of being very sorry. Uh, she never paid her fine and she never finished her community service, as far as I know. Anyway, next Friday when we were out on the streets, we were heroes. And we became known as the churches. She'd gone round and told everybody that the churches had turned up at court. So unbeknown to me, I'd cracked it because I'd made it with Maggie. And because I was her friend... She was the way in to being able to build friendships with the rest of these girls. I walked alongside Maggie for about six years. She became a heavy drinker and a mild drug user. She often asked for money and food, and I had to learn what it meant to put boundaries in place. She asked for a lot of help whether it be for housing, whether it be about her drug addiction or alcohol addiction. I learned where, as I went along, really, and uh, took her to places to get help, but she never saw anything through. I got very frustrated with her. Um, it was a steep learning curve for me, and I learned that actually I could support her, but I couldn't do it for her, and the stuff she had to do for herself. She knew where I lived and often turned up at really inappropriate times. At that time, we had a pretty open house uh, for young people, but um, she turned up one night, um, and it was the only, <laughs> the only time I ever remember my husband really losing the plot. I was eight months pregnant, and at half past ten at night, I'm having a conversation on the doorstep with Maggie for about an hour. At this point, we didn't let her in, because she used to nick stuff, because um, she was a, a drug addict by this point. And Tony said to me, at what point are you going to draw a line with Maggie? But this verse, he's already made it plain how to live, what to do, what God is looking for in men and women. Is it give her a cup of soup gospel? Or do what is fair and just to your neighbour, be compassionate and loyal in your love. I don't know why I had this love for Maggie. <laughs> it must have come from God, because she did not treat me well at all. I remember a time when I gave her a lift to get a methadone script. She wasn't allowed in any of the chemists in the town where we lived, so I took her in the, to the next town, took her in the car. I had my four-month-old daughter in the back of the car. Didn't do that boundary very well, did I? Waited in a car park in, uh, in this town for her while she went to Boots, and I looked in my rearview mirror and I saw her running across the car park, sprinting across the car park back to the car with three carrier bags full of stuff. Well, I knew she had no money, so I knew that stuff was nicked. And in that split second, I thought, this looks like I'm a getaway driver. So I get out the car, leave my daughter in there, lock the car, and then I see, running behind Maggie, are two security guards. So I'm like, oh, I'm going to get arrested here. <laughs> so anyway, they came over. Maggie said, not as politely as this, open the car, we need to drive off. And I'm like, I'm not taking you anywhere. So with a bit of smooth talking to the security guards and my ID card and a phone call to my senior minister, Maggie is arrested and I'm, they let me go. So Maggie said as she was arrested, can you come to the police station? And I went, no and I don't want to see you for three months. And I got in the car and I drove off. Three months and a day, she turns up on my doorstep. She did stay away for, th for three months, but she came back. Do what is fair and just to your neighbour. Be compassionate and loyal in your love. I kind of didn't know what I was doing. I'm, I'm winging this from week to week. I have no idea. She was later given a flat by the Housing Association, 200 yards from my front door. And I'm like, God, really? As a church, for six years, we journeyed with her. 
The church helped furnish her flat. Someone gave her their old leather suite. Two weeks later, Tony sees it for sale outside a shop because she's flogged it to the shop so she can get money for drugs. I loved this young woman, even though she hurt me over and over again. I loved her. Don't ask, well, only God can have put that love in me because she was difficult to love. But do you know what? Maggie is made in the image of God. She had been let down by so many people and she had made pretty major wrong choices herself. Now, I'd love to tell you she became a Christian, she attends church and she's now a home group leader. She's not. (laughs) Six years of giving and loving, she moved from, why the are you on the streets with us, to actually you church people are okay, which for me was a massive journey to watch her go on. The stuff that happened to her as a child and as a teenager will probably blight her for the rest of her life. She would never fit into church life. The gospel as I understood it then was irrelevant to her and I had to relearn a language that she would understand. And actually that language was, I'm here for you, I see you. That's God's gospel message for her, I'm here for you and I see you. Five years after we moved away from there, we moved to Preston, I had a phone call from um, a prison chaplain. Maggie was in prison for a long stretch. And she just happened to ask a prison chaplain, do you know Sandra Crawford? And guess what? The prison chaplain did know me. (laughs) We'd met at somewhere. One of those God incidences. So the prison chaplain got in touch with me. And actually, I didn't feel it right to go and visit Maggie. I asked someone from that church that I had worked at to go and visit, because that's where Maggie would have been going back to. Um, Maggie's impact on my life was massive. To this day, she's the person who changed my understanding of who God is and what the gospel is. All the stuff I thought I understood and I had simmered down into this little packet to give to people, she just took it apart. She threw bits out, she caused me to throw bits out and it was like relearning what real soup is and putting those ingredients, those fresh ingredients, into that soup maker. It was like, what does it mean to show Maggie that God loves her? It isn't giving her something like this. It's not giving her a tin of soup. It's walking by her side for six years. She said to me, social workers give up on me. Um, Police give up on me. Probation give up on me. You as a church have stuck with me for six years. She noticed our house up for sale when we were about to move and she came and knocked on the door and she burst into tears. She she said, don't leave me. You've been with me for so long. And I said, well, we're going. I said, but the church is still here. And church on the street carried on for a lot longer after we left. Was that about the renewing of my mind? I think it was. My understanding of God changed. My white, middle-class, educated, privileged understanding of gospel was challenged. I had to deconstruct what I believed. How do I communicate the love of God to someone for whom love means something really different? Love meant being used and being abused. How do you communicate the love of God to someone about Father God when Father was a really unhelpful concept for her? She didn't feel worthy enough ever to come to church, to come to a building. She didn't have the right clothes, she couldn't read, she did not fit. And yet church went to her and sat with her most Friday nights in a shop doorway. I learned a bit about a God who is there and a God who sees. That Bible first says, as we lo- offer love and compassion and loyalty, we need to allow it to change us, to renew our minds. I think I met Jesus in Maggie. My understanding of Jesus changed. Maggie was made, or is made in the image of God, just like you and me. 
And as I ponder, I wonder whether we as church could be more open to the maggots of this world. Not just our projects midweek, but the way we gather to worship together. How, how do we make those gatherings open to someone like Maggie? I met God in a new way through her. I will always be thankful uh, for Maggie and the impact she had on my life. So that's the longest one of the stories. Have we got the PowerPoint slides or not? Or we have not got them? Okay, no worries. So the second story is, towards the end of my time in Manchester, before we moved, I had the sad task of taking the funeral of a young lad who died um, in his early 20s. He went to bed drunk and choked on his own vomit. And we spent many hours on the streets helping the young people set up a prayer vigil um, outside the flat uh, where he lived. Uh, that included them graffitiising the walls. That's a bit of a problem, isn't it? I'm overseeing illegal stuff, but anyway. Um, they graffitiised the walls. They wrote poems about him on the walls of the flat. Um, they put up pictures and they had candles and we helped them in that start of their journey of grief. During that period, they had a vow of uh, none of them were ever going to drink again. <laughs> yeah, that lasted until the wake. Um, <laughs> I was asked as the, the street vicar, which is what they called me, I was asked as a street vicar to do the funeral. And I said, yeah, okay. But the young people said, but we can't come. I said, why can't you come? They said, because we haven't got the right clothes to wear. Folks, what have we done with the radical message of Jesus when people think they can't come to a funeral because they haven't got the right clothes to wear? Now, I was in my 20s at this point, and I wanted to wear the clothes I wore for detached youth work to do the funeral, but my senior minister wouldn't let me. Today, I would have done it anyway, but I was young and naive then, and I did what I was told. It didn't last for long. Um, 200 of them turned up to the funeral. But again, I looked at them, and I thought, this is probably the one and only time they're ever going to be in this building, in this church, to say goodbye to their friend. But they don't feel welcome here. They don't feel part of this, because they don't have the clothes. Most of them can't read. They just will not feel part of this community. And it may be just question the way we are and the way we do church. Is it really what Jesus intended? Have we become too wedded to the format that we're so used to that actually we can't envisage another way of being? What does the gospel and good news look like for those young people? What should church look like? For six years, we sat in shop doorways with them on a Friday night in all weathers. We listened to them, we journeyed with them. Was that church? We shared food with them. Chips, kebabs, Coke. Was that communion? Oh, that's a bit radical, isn't it? It wasn't a bit of bread and a bit of wine in a nice warm building on a Sunday morning. We talked about Jesus. We prayed with them, and we shared food with them. What's that communion? Those young people shaped me and challenged me and my understanding of God. And actually, it's because of them I'm now doing what I'm doing in Jaywick 20 years, like, further, 20 years further on. So third story is about Gail. So before I tell you this story, we're going to, um, have you got the video clip of the Lord's Prayer? So this is a group of um, people I work with in Preston, uh, all with additional needs. And uh, so we're going to say the Lord's Prayer together with them as we watch this. And you might want to do the actions because they're doing it in various forms of sign language. So let's, uh, let's pray this together with them. This is the Good News Group at St. Andrew signing the Lord's Prayer. Yeah. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our wishes. 
it the bread. Forgive for our sin as we forgive them sin against us. And not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. For the kingdom. The power and the glory is yours. Forever and ever and all day. Amen. 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 So Gail, on that video, used to come to our uh, lunch club on a Thursday. She has numerous complex needs. Uh, she's, on the whole, she's non-verbal, but makes a lot of very loud and sudden noises. She can't read or write. She needs help with all daily activities and tasks. But if she likes you, she rubs your ear. Okay, now listen, I don't do hugs, okay? I play the saxophone and guitar in worship band so that no one can hug me. But Gail decided I was her friend and used to hold on to my ear. That was, I, I really struggled, but I knew that that's how she showed her friendship. So I let her hold on to my ear for about 20 minutes on a Thursday, every Thursday. But I learned something about God through her too. She would never fit into Sunday church life, okay? And she did come sometimes, but she would frighten the life out of people because when she shouted, she shouted. And when she wanted to leave, she would just get up and move anything that was in her way, whether it was a person, a chair, or whatever. But Gail is made in the image of God. What does gospel look like to Gail? So, for most of my Christian life, I've been an absolute mad activist, okay? Which is probably why I've now got ME, because I'm knackered. But, and I think some of that activism is I'm trying to please God. I know you shouldn't, but I think that is what I'm doing, if I'm real. But Gail can't do that, and God still loves her. So, it was a real challenge to me through getting to know Gail. If God loves Gail as Gail, then why am I running around like a crazy thing? Because God loves me for being me as well, not for what I do. I'd like to say I learnt that earlier than 50-odd years, but I, I'm still trying to learn it. I was off sick for uh, six weeks at one period. Um, I got pneumonia, and I was off work. I couldn't do anything. I was pretty much laid up in bed for six weeks. Um, I went back to church after that, went back to lunch club, and Gail was there. And as I walked in, I didn't know she could speak until this point, I walked in, and Gail shouted my name. And everybody just went... <laughs> Where did that come from? And she didn't say very much. She could say the odd word, but I didn't realise she knew my name. And I went and sat with her, and guess what? She held my ear. <laughs> but as I served Gail and loved Gail, my mind was being renewed. God loves Gail for being Gail. Not because of what she believes, not because of what she does, not because of what she has theologically worked out, and theologically lives out, he loves Gail for being Gail. And do you know what? He loves you for being you as well. And that was a massive learning curve for me. God loves me whether I'm active or whether I'm still. God loves me because he loves me, not because of what I do or what I believe. And then the last story was very recent. I helped with this youth club. I've done youth work for 30 years. I have an MA in youth work. I know what I'm doing till I move to Jaywick. <laughs> this is another level of youth work. We have five paid workers in most sessions, about 30 young people, utterly chaotic. I went into youth club the other week and it's been an exhausting month. Uh, uh, January was an exhausting month for me. My dad's been quite poorly, uh, had major surgery. I was absolutely exhausted. I walked into this youth club and uh, Millie was sitting under the football table and she beckoned me over. She's about eight years old. So I went over and she said, come and sit under the table with me. So I grabbed a blanket, went and sat under the table and she said, you look really sad. 
So I just explained a little bit about what had been going on. And, uh, and I said to her, but Millie, you've not been yourself recently either. I said, you've, you've, just, you've been quite quiet, and Millie's really loud normally. So she went, yeah, there's just stuff going on. Millie's mum is uh, back taking drugs. What I did realise was a child who lives with trauma picks up trauma in other people fairly quickly. It's quite perceptive. For 45 minutes, I sat under the football table with her, sheltering from the chaos of youth club. And it was just like the two of us had found this hidey place. <laughs> and it was as if Jesus had said to me, just come and sit with me under this table. Through the voice, through the words of an eight-year-old child, come and sit with me under this table and shelter from the chaos that is around you. So for 45 minutes, we sat under there playing a game of bingo. Just her and us. The renewing of my mind. I met Jesus that night through that little girl who just said, come and be with me, come and rest with me. I see you. Those verses said, he's already made it plain how to live, what to do, what God is looking for in men and women. Do what is fair and just to your neighbour. Be compassionate and loyal in your love. And take your everyday ordinary life Place it before God as an offering. So I kind of want to encourage you, I think, through those stories, to be eager to share the good news of Jesus, the life-changing gospel of Jesus. But don't do it like this, with a cup of soup. Do it by walking with someone for six years. Do it by enabling a bunch of young people to mourn the loss of their friend by building a relationship with someone who holds your ear, even if it really irritates you. <laughs> by building a friendship with someone who invites you to sit under a football table with them. Let's not give away cup of soup, but prepare to give away our lives to share the radical, life-changing gospel of Jesus. And meet God in those unusual people as we get to know them. So that's all I've got to say. I've given you a whole five minutes to ask me questions because I have got a prayer that I want to finish with. So, is that okay? <laughs> Has everybody got anything they'd like to ask? I'll bring the microphone to you. Okay, Janet. I might not be able to answer the question. But that's you know. okay. <laughs> Go for it. You have been intellectually educated in the Bible and the, that side of life. But when you go out and meet these people that have no um, perception of um, all the messages within the Bible that are interpreted by um, our ministers or pastors or anybody we've met during my life and yet you go out there and you're saying Jesus loves you and Jesus cares how do you ever interpret the stories of Jesus to these people or do you not find you have to because the calling you've been given just teaches you to do what you do and how you do it and all the Gospels and the things that you've learnt and the interpretation of the Bible that you've learnt just comes part of your being. I think the older I've got, the less I understand about the Bible. You know, I came out of Bible college thinking I knew it all. Um, I, I, don't, I, I know very little now. And actually, you know, the Jesus people are going to meet is not through the Jesus... Uh, through reading the Bible, the Jesus people meet is by meeting you and meeting me. Uh, and the one thing that, I, I, I've done some work in Calais in the jungle when the jungle was there with the refugees, and one thing God clearly said to me in the jungle when I first went, there were 8,000 people in the jungle in the refugee camp. And it was overwhelming. And God said to me, just love the person in front of you. What does it mean to love that person in front of you now? That's how people are going to meet Jesus. 
if you're walking the streets and coming alongside people. So many people I work with don't read. So they're not going to read about Jesus in the Bible. They're going to meet him through you and through me. Uh, I might have have a master's (laughs) in youth work and theology, but I'm not actually that bright, to be honest. So I take the bits of the Bible I do understand and apply them, and I don't worry about the other bits. Um, You know, love your neighbour. What does that mean in reality in everyday life? Love that person in front of you. Okay, this isn't a question, Sandra, but I just want to say I've seen a documentary about Jay Wick. I visited Jay Wick, and my goodness, we need to pray for you. And I think it's fantastic that you've gone there. So, my message to anyone who says, What can we do for Jay Wick? I say, Just sell your house and come and move in. <laughs> I live in a flood zone, I might not have a house in 10 years. But Do you know what? It's the most warm and welcoming community I've ever lived in. Um, It's got some really bad news stories, but do you know what? What's not getting out is the good news stories of that place as well. Uh, But I appreciate what you say. It is tough, but but I love it and I thrive on it. So, (laughs) Two more and then we'll do Sandra's prayer. And then I'll pray. I I found what you've said is fascinating. I I think we're living in times at the moment where the systems are broken. Uh, My daughter works in mental health with youth and children, and the foster care and everything else is absolutely broken at the moment. And I think this is where the church can offer help where we can. It's knowing, as you say, the person in front of you, but it's knowing what we can do to help the church um, meet the system that we're meeting at the moment yeah. in, in a way like no, nowhere before um, I'm finding that um, there's such need out there there really is we also need to recognise the church is broken <laughs> you know a third of Baptist churches in our country are in decline another third of them are standing still which actually means reality wise they're in decline Um, We have to find new ways of being church and we're stuck in a model that actually I think we need to break out of and take a few more risks, Um, which is easy for me to say, come and visit in here, it's harder for you to say. (laughs) I'm just so interested to hear, you know, what you said about the sort of people that you work with or have have worked with and um, what was sort of coming up for me is, is... do you find yourself getting angry about people's situations? And if so, what, what do you do about maybe a sense of anger about sort of social injustice and, you know, the terrible things that people are going through? Like, you know, the lady, the first lady you spoke about, she'd had such a terrible life, but there's very little, you know, we, we can keep trying, keep trying, but she's going to keep rejecting because that's her experience. I just wonder, you know, do you feel angry? Do you, and, ha- and if you do, how do you channel that? And how can you be, um, how can you be sort of like Christian <laughs> and feel that anger? <laughs> I don't know that I feel angry as much as overwhelmed. Um, I probably notice it more at the moment. So if you know, if you know the geography of, of where Jaywick is, Frinton is 10 miles down the road. So Frinton Free Church is one of the biggest churches in the Eastern Baptist Association. It's very rich. It's a very rich area, living inside the gates, all that kind of stuff. And, and to me, I, so you've got one of the richest places right next door to the poorest place in the country. And it, it's similar in Manchester. So Altrincham was right next to Withenshaw. You've got exactly the same issue going on. We spent some time in Thailand when we were younger, and you had exactly the same thing. You had the rich right next to the slums. And it's the fact you see that massive inequality. Um, And as Christians, somehow we should be living differently. We should not be just accepting of that massive inequality. So someone came to Jay Witt the other day, a Christian guy, who I just got very irritated with. hope he's not here. (laughs) Um, Because he just said, I've got the answer for Jay Witt. Been there 10 minutes. This is what you need to be doing. You just need new houses. No, you don't. Because the poverty there is, so, is just layer upon layer of poverty on all different levels, on all different issues, generational, 
It is not a case of just providing better housing. Um, the education is appalling. And the number of children who are not in school at all, that shouldn't be allowed. <laughs> but it is, it's just ignored. Um, yeah, so I get overwhelmed more than I get angry, I think. And for me, the, the thing that God keeps saying to me is, I, I'm not a structural person, that isn't how I work. And a couple of folks that I have got to know at Friends and Free have said to me, you need to get involved in trying to challenge the structures of why JWIG is like it is. Okay, that might be someone's calling, it isn't mine. My calling is to walk the streets and meet people and walk alongside them. Um, and just love that person in front of me. One of the other things God has called me to since we've moved to JWIC is to be um, a person of prayer more than I've ever been. And I find that really hard. That might be odd for you to hear from a minister. I find it really hard to pray for a long period of time. But that's what God's called me to. And I think God's called us to that, to be more contemplative because of what we're living amongst and what we're dealing with on a daily basis. Um, I'm great at spinning plates, but actually I think God's telling us to slow down, spend time with him, and look for him as we go out and meet people. Um, so being contemplative, more comp contemplative, is what I'm trying to do. Not very well. <laughs> and anyone who's known me for a long period of time just laughs when I tell them that's what I'm trying to do. But I'm working on it. <laughs> Can we finish with a prayer? Is that okay? Let's pray. Jesus, we resolve to live life in all its fullness. We welcome the people who will be part of each day this week. We greet you in the ordinary and hidden moments. We choose to live the life we're given and find the wisdom that we need. May we hear the needs of those that we meet. May we love the people that we meet. And may we love the life that we're given. God be with us. Amen. Amen. Uh, Sandra, thank you for coming and sharing with us. We appreciate that. Um, I pray for you as you go home, because... Uh, we're hoping your car will get you all the way back to Jay Wick. It's got a fabulous prayer. Yeah, it's got a, a flashing light on the screen that's not very encouraging. So uh, <laughs> we need to pray for a safe journey to Jay Wick. But uh, thank you for being, thank you for sharing so openly with us this evening. It's been uh, a real joy. So uh, let's say thank you to Sandra, everybody. <laughs> so, so next week is with Agnes. There is a little bit of cake left. If you're desperate to ask Sandra a question, I'm sure you might be able to do that, but she's got quite a long journey home, so we're going to attempt to let Sandra get on the road fairly quickly. But thank you for coming, and we'll see you next week.